welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Uh, 
uh, the venue B E N U. Uh, it's represented uh, usually as a gray hair, the equivalent of the red blue that we have here in, in America. And it's a solar uh, density, uh, and eventually the Bennu becomes the phoenix for the, for the Greek. And the bird next to it, any idea? The name is right there, in fact. It has its name on its head. <laughs> so for both of you can look at hieroglyphs. This is actually the sister of a, of a goddess that you might know better from ancient Egypt. Isis, that's Isis' sister, uh, Nephthys, and uh, this is actually a facsimile that we have at the Oriental Institute of a uh, scene from a tomb, a very famous tomb in ancient Egypt, the tomb of Queen Nefertari, uh, QV 66. Uh, here you would have, on the wall, you would have Isis and Nephthys, uh, Nephthys uh, mourning the body of Osiris between them. So here we have Nephthys, and she has, as I said, her name on her head, and she's represented uh, as a falcon, as a female kestrel, in that particular case. And those are some of the artifacts that we had selected uh, to illustrate the importance of various in ancient Egypt. And one aspect in particular uh, that is most visible for us now is that of the sacred animal cults. Uh, and this is what you mostly see in these images. Uh, so sacred animal cult, and of course in our case it's going to be sacred bird cults. And it's the cult of uh, the ibis of thought and of the falcon of horse for the most part. And because I don't think it's <laughs> I'm going to be talking about bird mummies because uh, in association with those sacred bird cults, there were millions, millions and millions of mummies that were manufactured. Uh, most of them, well, yes, most of them are still in situ actually in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, they were deposited in catacombs and in tombs that had been dedicated to those uh, to those birds. But some of them have made their way to a museum collection all over the world, in fact, and we have a selection of them. And what you see here are a few of the mummies that we have at the Oriental Institute Museum. So I thought mummies would just be ideal, and I forgot I just added a little something not too long ago. Let me see if it works a little bit of ambiance. We were supposed to play it earlier. Those are two great horned owls talking to one another, but we don't really hear very well. Mm -hmm. no, it's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was just to give a, a little bit of an atmosphere. So for those of you who may not know so much about the fact that the ancient Egyptian did not just mummify their dead relatives uh, for them to survive for eternity, but they did so also for some animals, and there are four types of mummies, uh, animal mummies that have been identified in the uh, uh, archaeological uh, uh, repertoire. And the main one of the one that we don't have so many of them is the pets. They are pet mummies. Uh, so if you had a special kitty or a special puppy, uh, you could have it mummified and placed in your tomb. But we have very few examples of those, and we do know that birds may have been kept as pets, but we do not have any pet mummies for, for birds. The first type of mummies that we have uh, that can be identified is that of victual mummies. And victual mummies are, in fact, uh, food offerings that had been placed in tombs. Uh, so the bird that you wanted to openly enjoy in your afterlife was prepared uh, for, for uh, essentially, really to be eaten. So you, you have like a goose that's prepared to be eaten on a platter. And most of the examples we have actually are uh, the one you see below. They are placed, the, the mummy itself, the mummified bird. Uh, the bird had been prepared, as I said, so uh, the feathers had been removed, internal organ removed. Sorry, folks who are still eating. I apologize, I'm so used to this. And it's placed in a wooden little coffinet that has the same shape as what's inside. And then it, they have been and around it to keep it nicely together. Uh, and this is uh, one of the mummies that we see in some Theban tombs. Not many examples, but we have one at the Oriental Institute. And it's one of the mummies that I were able to, to study. The other types of mummies are those connected to the sacred animal cults. Uh, and you have two types of cult animals and votive mummies, and I'm going to focus mostly on those today. And all of the mummies that you see here, once again, are those that I was able to study from the Oriental Museum collection. A few words, a 
the, the sacred miracles. We don't fully understand it, but we see starting during the second half of the second, of the first millennium BC, uh, the popularity of sacred animal cults really reaches new heights. Uh, we see call centers dedicated to a variety of animals. And perhaps <coughs> one of the most common in the literature uh, is that of the apis bull. It was described in detail by uh, the Greek uh, traveler like Herodotus talks about it. He talks about those animal cults. And the apis bull even, even was a, a kind of a tourism attraction, like people would go and check it out. So there is the, the bull, the cats, the dogs. Uh, all those eventually were uh, worshipped uh, uh, in, a, in a very different way that we didn't see so much before. And in association with those cults, you have the production of millions of mummies. Uh, the bird cult that we are going to talk about today, as I mentioned earlier, are those of the ibis and those of the falcon. So we have millions of those remains. Based on what we can see in the archaeology, so we do have text talking about the fact that those mummies were produced, that they were call centers with which there were animals connected. Uh, we know that some were raised in captivity, and you can see, for example, here a representation there. That's the only one I know of where you actually see priests coming to feed the, uh, the ibises. So we know that they had them in captivity, uh, but we also know that they went into the wild to, uh, to capture some of those. But what I'm especially interested in is what can we learn, because we actually have birds that are 2,000 years old. Uh, so we can, like, we have those remains, so that's what I'm interested in. I used to be a chemist, so I used to be a scientist, so that scientific vibe in me is just being really compelled to do something with those remains. So that's what I'm interested in the most, for the most part. The cult animals are not very uh, common. We don't have many mummies of those, especially the birds are harder to identify. The cult animal was considered to be, so there would be one at one time, it was considered to be the living manifestation of a particular deity. Uh, it would be during its life, because it had a divine essence, oops, sorry, divine essence inside it, it would be considered to be a god, so it would be treated with great luxury, and also at its death would be buried with great pomp. So usually those mummies, we know, those that we know of for the most part of mammals like the apis bull, also the ram of Mendes, and they are covered with gold, very luxurious coffin. Bird is more of a challenge, and you see one of them here. We know of the living falcon of Etfu in southern Egypt, and uh, here it's interesting because you see the god Horus, uh, who is the, to whom the temple is dedicated. So you have the god standing to the left, and in front of him is the living representation of himself uh, in the form of a falcon. And the falcon here, the living falcon, is in a shrine uh, being presented to the god. Uh, but we do, we, I'm wondering, this is one of the mummies that we have here the, in the UI at the Oriental Institute. It's a uh, big baby. Uh, if you got to see the exhibit, it was on display. Uh, it's a big eagle uh, that was mummified <coughs> at some point. It was brought by uh, James Henry Breasted, the founder of the Institute, uh, and he purchased it during his honeymoon in 1894-95. Uh, he, he had just become professor here at the University and Roosevelt, not Roosevelt, sorry, Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller gave him some money uh, to go and purchase antiquities so he could have object artifact in his museum. So he decided to buy mummies. He bought quite a few actually, a lot of the bird mummies that we have, two thirds of them come from that time. Uh, and he also brought human mummies, and I'm sure if you've gone to talks at the OI, you know, here, you, you may have heard that he had, I guess, a human mummy under his bed while, well, you know, during the honeymoon. That's where he stuck his <laughs> But this guy is interesting because he would have been covered at some point with uh, linen bandelets, like you usually expect mummies to be. Uh, you do see little remains on its, on its legs. What I assume happened, we don't know exactly, but people may have known what was inside, and we are lucky now because we have medical imaging to be able to identify contents without having to uh, to do any damage to the actual mummy. But by then, like to have Victorian parties of unwrapping the mummies. Well, I'm wondering if they had like a special party of unwrapping the bird mummy. I don't know. But that's what they discovered is um is a gilded bird. So that's not just any any boring treatment, so to speak. It's a very luxurious treatment for that bird. It was covered with uh, gold foil. 
So I cannot help, I don't know because there is no record exactly of where it comes from, but I don't know if it is a cold bird, but it's quite quite a fancy treatment for, for a dead bird to be covered with gold. So that's one type of mummies. The others come from the, the majority of the other bird mummies that we have, are what we call voted uh, mummies. Like you think of ex voto, for example, like people going to churches and giving, uh, or paying for a candle or whatever, or the offering that you give with a prayer. It has been thought by some Egyptologists that's what the mummies were for, because some of them were found with a prayer. So that's why people call them votive mummies. And we have millions of them, many of them still in situ. And you can see on that map all the various uh, cemeteries all over the country, even in the oasis, uh, where those cemeteries with bird mummies have been found. So they really are everywhere. And that's why when I talked about the, uh, the, the rise in popularity, that's how we say it became really popular everywhere, uh, every, in every part of the country. Uh, and here you have a, an example, for example, from Stakara of bird mummies placed into pots and then stacked into catacombs. And then many, many galleries filled like that. And the other major one is Tunel Gebel. The one that we have at the Oriental Institute are coming from Achmim and Abaido. So Achmim are those that are possibly, well, we assume based on what we have in the documentation, there's a question mark next to Achmim for the mummies purchased by James Henry Preston. So I need to do a bit more research in all these letters uh, to make sure that that's exactly where they come from. Uh, the others come from the side of Abaido. So those came actually from an excavation. So this is, this is very different. We, the Oriental Institute uh, uh, provided funding for the, uh, uh, the excavation on the site of the Bible in 1913-1914. So in exchange, the archaeologists sent us a couple of a selection of mummies. So those are the other ones that we have in the collection. And Can here ask, are... Oh, yes, please. Wait, you may have said before, but I just... That's all right. I didn't hear it. The votive? What is... How do you mean votive? Well, we think uh, this is one assumption that uh, in connection with those animal cults, very good question. So why voted? Uh, in association with those cults, those cults, uh, those uh, sacred animal cults, there would have been pilgrimages taking place, and it has been suggested by some uh, uh, Egyptologists that those mummies could have been purchased, essentially, by pilgrims coming to visit the central cult centers, uh, they, were, they would have been given to priests, and perhaps a prayer either written or perhaps said out loud. A lot of people could not write, so uh, they could have uh, uh, added a, a prayer of some sort with the mummy, and then the priest would have eventually, once a year, a couple of times a year, would have deposited them. Uh, so it would have been an offering to the cult, to the deity. But it, it's still not sure, actually, that some people don't agree with that idea, but that's usually how they are called. Is there something connected with fire as well? I mean, the boat in a sense? No. Is there usually fire connected? Like, yeah, a flame or anything like that? I don't know. I don't think so. Not in that case. No, I don't know that I'm aware of. So those are a few of them, and they're always very pretty. And as you can see, another one here was uh, unwrapped at some point and uh, revealed an ibis, and that's coming from a bios. So, yes, it is an ibis. It's, uh, I'll show you why. Its head is turned, that's its belly, yeah. wings. Uh -huh. Its neck has been turned backwards, and its, yeah. its leg, its uh, head is resting on its belly. And its, wow. its legs are folded, you wouldn't really see them, and they're underneath the wings. <coughs> I don't, I've never been able to touch any of those, so it's only because I know of other mummies uh, from, uh, that, from CT scan x ray that I know what it looks like. Cause those are organic remains, and uh, conservation is very strict. I am not allowed to touch any of those. <clears throat> so we are very lucky now because we have medical imaging to be able to study those mummies. We don't have to unwrap them anymore to be able to understand them. And uh, it is now uh, understood that those are artifacts as such that it's, they used to be considered for the longest time as animal specimens. So people, the naturalists, would study them to study the birds. Uh, so they would unwrap them, uh, essentially put all the skeleton back together, and you have a lot of those mummies that have been placed afterwards in Natural History Museum because they wanted to identify which birds were in Egypt. Uh, so in the uh, beginning of the 19th century, hundreds of mummies were, were uh, what's the word, dissected that way. 
Nowadays, we see then that we actually can learn a lot from the uh, object as a whole, uh, the way it's, it's wrapped, uh, the way uh, it has been mummified, because a lot of them have come to us to, essentially every single Egyptian collection in the, uh, in the country has a few of them. Uh, people brought them as souvenirs during the 18th, 19th, and even 20th century. People got them as souvenirs from Egypt because they were so common to so would buy them. Uh, and so we don't have a context for them. So we have lots of objects all over the place, but we don't know exactly where they come from. So being able to identify some trends in the way they were mummified, they were, they were, uh, the bodies were, were, or, were what's the word, uh, positioned, you may be able to identify workshops. That's where the mummies would come from. So now we use medical imaging, which is a non-invasive and non-destructive and non -destructive method. Uh, in the, that's the first one that we studied. I was not here in 1989, so the virtual mummy that we have in the collection was sent to the hospital to get uh, an x-ray. Uh, x-ray is nice because we can see a little bit what's inside. We can see the skeleton, but you also see there is a lot of superimposition of the uh, anatomical features, so it's not necessarily easy to, uh, to, to see what's going on. Is it too start? We're not going to play. But what I really want uh, to do now is CD scanning, because CD scanning has become uh, just what we can do with the data is incredible. So essentially, this is CT scan. This is an X-ray, 360 degrees. You acquire uh, diagram data that you can afterwards, with uh, some fancy uh, 3D imaging software, you can actually uh, manipulate data, uh, do some 3D recreation, 2D also reformations, and then the data can be can be really uh, manipulated. Here, what you have. Of what I call modern birds, because when I talked to the radiologists at the hospital, they said, well, it's very nice to scan birds, but I've never scanned birds before, so I don't know what to expect. So they asked me to find some dead birds. Uh, so I, was, I, know. I was very lucky because I, I've been working from the start, since the beginning of the exhibit, with the film museum. Uh, and they have freezers filled with uh, dead birds because they uh, gather, oops, sorry, all the dead birds that are found in the city. Uh, for our research, uh, so if you there is a not to do that's a little bit off topic, but there is what is called bird collision monitoring. Uh, people will gather birds all over the city and identify which ones are hit by the buildings and such. So here we have uh, a couple of small birds. The one to your left is a right neck, so that's not even an American bird, it's actually a European bird, but it was found in America, in the US. It probably got stuck in a crate uh, in Europe, made its way to the US, and was found desiccated. So it's a naturally desiccated bird, which for me was very interesting, because it's a natural mummy. So this is what you see here, and that was especially interesting to see how the organ inside, how they desiccated and how it shows up on the skin. And the other very colorful little guy is a song sparrow. Um, <clears throat> and that, I didn't do those fancy renderings because I don't have the, the, the fancy software, but I had uh, engineers who did it for me who were very kind. And uh, you can iso is isolate in different colors the various uh, anatomical elements. So that in green, you have the skeleton. And in white and red, it's a uh, uh, breathing apparatus that you see. Uh, so it's just fascinating what you can do. So that's how we play a bit with those birds. And then our our bird mummies went to the hospital, so it was not a long trip at all. It was just a few hundred yards, but boy, it was quite quite an endeavor because those are very fragile artifacts. They are very they very much desiccated. They come from the desert. Uh, I've been sitting in climate control uh, rooms for quite a while, and because they're very desiccated, they are going to be very much. Uh, they could be. Uh, um, the relative humidity of the air could have some very nasty effect on them. So we were trying to find days that were more or less as close to uh, what they have in their normal environment. Uh, so the more or less the same relative humidity and same temperature. We tried as much as we could. And then because they are so desiccated, they are very brittle. So they had to have special packaging, uh, the cases were made to fit them specifically. So it was a lot of work on the part of the conservatives. And then they went to the CT scanner. So that's the clinical CT scanner uh, in the radiology department. 
that gives you an idea. So we had one guy, one little guy, who was small enough to be able to fit in the micro CT scanner. So uh, he was uh, nicely wrapped up, and uh, we got to see him very much in detail. You'll get to see that later. So this is what I was trying to identify. So as I was saying earlier, it's, a, it's actually very interesting for us, diabetologists, to identify how the bird uh, was prepared for eternity, how it was involved. So, uh, was it very similar to what they did for humans? Did they remove all the internal organs or not? Uh, did they add amulet like they did for humans? Uh, can we see how it lived and died? And also, because I am a former scientist, I'm very interested also in studying an identified type of species, the type of birds that were actually found in Egypt at the time. So we are going to start with the Victor mummy that you see x-rayed before. And what you see here is actually a 3D rendering of the mummies that the, uh, one of the medical physicists uh, did for me. And this is what is inside. So as you can see, you can get so much more information than what we got from the x-ray. So what you can see is that uh, it had been eviscerated to a certain point. All feathers are already removed, head, feet, all that's gone. Uh, and they put a bowl of cloth, I think, to keep it a nice shape and to fill up the abdominal cavity. Uh, so this is mummy number one. And then my possible uh, cult bird, my gilded eagle, uh, this, uh, those wonderful, incredible images were uh, done by uh, J.P. Brown, who is a conservator at the Film Museum, who also has an incredible fancy software. Uh, so while you can see that it's an uh, adult, uh, is a skeleton is uh, fully calcified, in perfect shape, nothing broken. Actually, I've been working more on that guy, and what I've put in the catalog needs to be changed because I have noticed that I had made a mistake. What I think, uh, his, his neck is not broken, so I do not know how he died. Uh, so, but his abdominal cavity has completely been cleaned up. Uh, what you see on to your right is that the the membranes that you see are what would have covered the organs, but the organ themselves are gone. And he's just a beauty for me. So I'm very fond of him. Well done. Yeah. Do you, I mean, they were sacrificing these birds, right? I mean, most of these mummies were actually just killed. They we weren't finding. No, I was. Talk about the do. I'm not talking about the yeah. that. <laughs> That's why it's a, it's a challenge, because some animals you can tell. The cats, for example, all the cats. No, let me repeat that. Many cats are kittens, actually. Many cat mummies are kittens, younger than a year old, and their neck is clearly broken. The bird is not so, I know, it, it is, I don't think of it, I try not to think of it, and that's why, with the bird it's a challenge, because I have not failed to clear cause of death. No, with my bird, my mummies, uh, sometimes people say they can see that their neck is broken, but how can you tell if the neck was broken pre or post mortem? Right. So it's always difficult. And with my vertebrae in particular, I cannot tell. I talked to vets. I had many people helping me because I'm not a non ethologist. So I cannot identify the cellular anatomy. And even if there is something wrong with the pathologist, I would not be able to see. So I talked to vets and they said, Well, we cannot really tell. One of them is there. Okay, my little, the one that was micro CT, his, neck, his head was essentially back on the body. It's almost like his head fell. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but for my other birds, the bigger birds, I cannot tell. So, well, I might as well tell you. But the best way, apparently, to actually dispose of a bird, especially this is a big bird, uh, you press them against you, you prevent them from breathing. So you hold the kill, and so they can't breathe, and they eventually die. Then there's no heaven. But that you would not see exactly. So I was asking myself, oh, I just, uh, and if it were to be poisoned, for example, I would not know either right. because I would not give any evidence. But yes, you're right. They all, at one site at Tuna Al Gebo, for example, or at Saqqara, uh, they estimate that they would be making about 10,000 mummies of birds a year. So that's a lot of birds to die naturally. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I tried to. Yeah, I feel bad. I feel bad. So I, but it's so okay. <laughs> it's not yeah, they probably they did for other animals. They probably did for those guys as well. But this guy, I thought had his neck broken, but it is not. He has a beautifully, nicely escarred, but then it's very interesting what you can do with the, the 3D 
uh, rendering of those mummies. So the type of mummies we have for the most part when it comes to votive mummies are ibises, uh, bird of prey variety, not just falcon. So Horus is represented as a falcon. He has nice long... Oh, yes! <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know anything about this. So we'll start there. I would have suspected that mummification would be a very expensive process. Yes, it is. Did everybody and their mother get to do a bird? I mean, if there were ten millions of these things, or was it? Did they have a middle class that could pay for that, or did the king pay for ten thousand a year in order That's to very honor good his? Question. And actually, very good question. So, who paid for the essentially the cold, those type of cold? Because if you're very right, you know, you don't have the endeavor because you have the people mummifying so you have to take care of the people uh, mummifying the birds the people making the pots you've seen a lot of the birds that deposit in pots the linen that you need to wrap all those mummies the type of chemicals that you need also to desiccate and, and embalm the birds so it is very expensive uh, the famous Rosetta stone for example uh, which is uh, decree of Ptolemy the fifth talks about the fact from this very decree that he is supporting so that Ptolemy during the Greek, the, uh, the Greek uh, uh, domination of Egypt when Egypt was under the rule of Macedonian kings not really Greek but Macedonian kings but they were very much supporting financially uh, some of those cults so it was uh, in part paid for mm -hmm. by the crown okay. Uh, in part, but we don't know if it was enough, or if people, individuals, would actually pay. We know that we have some texts saying that mummies would be gathered from various cemeteries to be brought to the main call centers at the beginning uh, of the phenomenon. Uh, so we do also have names of individuals for certain mummies. So did those people specifically pay for it? That's why we are not sure exactly how it worked. Okay. Uh, but that, the crown, that's, a very good, that's why your question is really good, because you're right, the crown did pay for it, because it was extremely expensive. And you cannot have but wonder why for a thousand years, it's almost a thousand years when that lasted. So it's not, and, and that's why we have, million, we have millions of mummies, because it lasted for a long time. Uh, around 700 BC till about the 3rd century AD during the Roman period. Uh, during the Roman period, it continued to be quite popular. And you have um, texts from the, sorry, from the Coptic period, actually, when the Christians come and they go to temples, because we have to destroy all those pagan temples, and they actually kill the sacred birds. Hmm. And put it in the fire, which breaks my heart every time. <laughs> <laughs> what is the uh, theology behind this? Uh, for the human beings, it would be the afterlife. Yep. What is the theology behind the birds being multiplied? So they are called, in text, they're called nature. So the mummies themselves are called nature, which means gods. Uh, by being uh, mummified, essentially the best thing you could do to the, to the to those birds actually to mummy to kill them so to speak, and to eventually mummify them because by mummifying them we transform them into a, a, a god so they become divine beings and by being divine we have we assume that perhaps they they were able to communicate with the main god directly on your behalf uh, on your on oh, oh, exactly. On the behalf of the pilgrims, that's one theory because it, unfortunately it's not really well spelled out, and we, people are writing a lot right now actually for whatever reason it's kind of hot topic that the sacred animal cults and try to understand why so much money was spent for those particular cults and why and because it starts to become popular when foreigners come to. Uh, take over the power in Egypt. They start with the Assyrians, then you have the Persians, then uh, and then eventually the Greek and then Romans, and that's when those cults are popular. Some people had said, oh, it's a national nationalistic way to show your Egyptian identity because Herodotus would write about the fact oh, those Egyptians who worship animals, I mean, really. So it's a barbar barbarian for that, but not the real cultivated people. We don't know if that's really what it was. It had always always existed, uh, but it not, people had been worshipping uh, the Apis bull or those type of sacred animals for many centuries before it became really popular. So it's not that like it was brand new, uh, but we don't fully understand why at that point it starts to just, it goes, just it just spreads all over the country. It's still unclear. But the idea is that those are sort of, Sacred, the cult animal is essentially the god, a uh, living god. Uh, when he dies, it is deified as even a different stage. And then every single animal 
uh, that had been mummified. He's also a god, perhaps in a hierarchy a little lower, it's hard to say. So that's what we think. So it's a complicated, <laughs> sorry. Yes, 10 minutes, sorry, I'll be quick. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, little guy. He's that big. Uh, we scan it three times, and it has a very interesting uh, shape. It's, you have the impression he has little arms, and, uh, and he also has painted on his face the features of a falcon. So we assume he had a mini bird of prey, which is possible, because some of the kestrels are very small. Uh, and it is covered, unfortunately, with a, what you see, the white powder is a lead paint. And it becomes an issue in the CT scanning, because he has a very bright, that shows up really, really well. On the, it is very dense. It is what the denser the material, the more the whiter it shows up in uh, in your X-ray or your CT scan images. So, if you try to remove that, you also remove your skeleton. So it's a pain in the butt. So, but this is what I see, and I seem to have little birds that big inside. I can can see little skulls, uh, little spines. Uh, and in a particular site of Achmim, uh, people who have found broken up mummies have identified swallows, yes? Just a quick question. You yeah. said lead paint. Is that from the Egyptian period, or did someone we, add that later? Yeah, that's a good question, too. That's something that would be... That's why studying those mummies mm -hmm. is going to be, uh, you know, all the mummies that we have, because I couldn't find any evidence. I know that, for example, during the Roman period, human mummies would be covered by a rape paint, which is also lead-based. But this is why, so I don't know uh, if it is from the Egyptian or perhaps conservators or whoever put that afterwards, but that's why it would be interesting to see if other collections have something similar. We have two like that, and I'm hoping to scan the other one, but I'm only able to scan this one, but this one is still a mystery, I'm not sure. And I was talking to the radiologist, we need to do a lot more work on this little guy. And now the mummy is created equal in me. This is the most beautiful one we have in the collection. Very beautiful, elaborate wrapping. Uh, 60 bands, all the same size in that chevron uh, design. But inside, you do not have a bird at all. <laughs> um, and that has been found. People who have been looking at more mummies, sometimes the, the more elaborate the wrapping, the less of the chance, the less of the chance. Well, they have a better chance of not having a complete bird inside. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it is a fake, like some people used to say, well, that's just the priest trying to make an extra buck because they don't have enough birds or they want to make more money. If they indeed sold the mummies, we don't know. But it could possibly be that also every part of the bird was sacred, and you do have a couple bones inside, so it's not like it doesn't have any animal part, and, but, and some reeds to give it a proper shape. So is it a part for the whole, and uh, having just a little bit of the bird would make it still effective, and, would still essentially become whole again in its afterlife and deliver the message all the same. Mm. Uh, but that was interesting because everybody would, before it was CT scan, it was always labeled an ibis mummy, and it is not. It is, uh, it is, the bones are from a big bird, so it has part of, a, from, of an ibis. So some of what I have learned from studying those mummies, I was able to scan 10 so far, and I'm hoping to bring more in the future, but you can see that some mummies have way more wrapping that they need. Mm. Uh, this one, for example, to your left, uh, the head doesn't have any, uh, any remains, and it's just uh, added to it to give it a nice little anthropomorphic shape. And linen is expensive, so that's interesting. Also, the one with a nice uh, coffered design is also uh, has a lot, quite a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, linen on top of it. So it was interesting to see that some were definitely more elaborate than others. Uh, I mentioned earlier, yeah, Eco is an adult, fully calcified bone, so a full-grown adult. But we also found that neonates, so little chicks, were also mummified. Uh, and then juvenile, when the bones are not fully calcified. And then the one you see to your right is actually the little kestrel that was micro ct And you can, it's, it's just a the skeleton, it's just a very, you see the little feet are there of pressure. It's just beautiful how you can really identify every part of its skeleton. And you were asking me if they found dead birds were perhaps they did because one of my mummies from Abydos uh, is is interesting because most of the bones are shattered and the biggest one is broken so it was essentially at, at the base of the head, the beak is broken and that was prior to uh, mummification so prior to wrapping so 
I know it's not something that happened over time. Um, missing one leg. So it is possible that they, we also know from text that a priest would go around the temple and gather whatever animal is dead and then make a mummy from it because being on the temple precinct, he becomes deified. So perhaps that's what we have. And what's interesting about this guy is that he has food in his tummy. Uh, he needs abdominal cavity, not in his tummy exactly. And those are shells of snails, freshwater snails that are intact and not food that he would have ingested. So it is food that was placed afterwards. Uh, so did they give food for him so that he can make its way to the afterlife? We don't know, but other, I've talked to other people and they have found more of those examples. Those are the type of birds that I was able to identify based on the skeleton that I, I saw. So you have our victual mummy, he's a white fronted goose, very pretty down there, sacred eye base, uh, the eagle that I was mentioning a bit, a little kestrel and a long legged buzzard. <gasps> Now it's time, sorry. <laughs> now it's time for the mummy. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to put uh, anybody a scene. Anything? I'll be quick. So, I figured, since I talk about mummies, I might as well bring one. And I will hold it so you can look at it. I don't look at you. The one that had the gold uh, yep. foil. So who thinks it is a real thing? <laughs> they can eventually print it, send it to a printer, a 3D printer, and this is the exact copy, so to speak, based on how the way it was scanned, this is the exact thing. You can people get, that's what people can touch. So this is essentially plaster uh, mixed with glue, and I'm not, I was never allowed, and I always fed it, but I was, <laughs> I was never allowed to touch the original. Uh, so this is a nice way, and I will pass it around if you, you have to be careful because that's my only one. But uh, that's one way to really get a chance to look closely and even the surface is the same as what the original was. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> so just don't drop it. <laughs> For sure. But I was not actually, the way I got it, it was a surprise for me because as a wonders mm -hmm. of the University of Chicago, uh, the exhibit was uh, uh, featured in the University of Chicago alumni magazine, and uh, Alan uh, read it, and he used to work here before in the medical center, but now works for a 3D imaging company, uh, so he was very excited, uh, contacted me, I uh, uploaded the, uh, the Dicon data of the ego, and they work with a 3D printing company, and for them it was fun, so they just printed it. And then actually I got a big box. <laughs> Hey, we printed the eagle, and actually what's, what's special about this bird is that it's printed in different colors. Very often 3D printing is um, very often like that beige color. Uh, this is one of the first that they actually do where you have the different colors, and the different colors <coughs> reflect the different densities. So the yellow, for example, those are the skeletal remains, which is denser. Uh, the, the black one, or most, mostly the feathers. Uh, the birds were eventually covered with resin, but that's, uh, that doesn't show up so much in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the city scan, but this is why you have those different colors. The gold actually was so thin that barely shows up 
in, uh, which is surprising because I expected it to be super bright, but it's very, very fine uh, bit of... Uh, is it, is, it the, is it the green stuff that you can sort of see on the photos? Is that the goal? Uh, it, could, it, it could be part of it actually, uh, that's a good point, part of it could be some of the yellowish uh, that you see. Uh, but like here for example, that sees uh, that sees the that is skill. And they also, which was very nice, uh, printed for me just the skeletal parts. And that is one to one, so I was able to go to the field museum and compare with actual specimen to be, to be able to identify, so that's what you have here. So this is a print of its wing, and those are bones of actual uh, eagles. So that gave me a, a, an idea of what the, uh, the species could be. What is the bird? Uh, so that's also something that was I realized that I'm not an ornithologist and I didn't realize. When I was using the books I was using, the Aquila repax was called the tawny eagle, and there was just one. With a subspecies which was called the step eagle. Now those are split, and it looks as if, so when I've had people looking at the book and telling me, this is not a tommy eagle, this is a step eagle. So that step eagle is an Aquila repax nipalensis. <laughs> and that's the one that would migrate through Egypt. And the books I was using were from 1982, and I guess things have changed since then. Uh, so this is what is wonderful. You know, you publish, you make mistake, and I don't mind it being, being told that this is incorrect. So I will uh, soon, my dissertation has priority right now, but I will eventually uh, modify the PDF that's online that you can download for free and make sure this is corrected and give credit to the person. How long does it take to print this? Um, for 10 hours. Yeah. Uh, 10 hours, and if you were to buy it, it would cost around $500. So it's $500 that you're holding it. So this is very much a collaborative project. Lots of people have been helping me. People at the OI who gave me access to the Maris, uh, and then people at the medical center who gave me access also to the well. And they did every all the CT scanning because I was not going to do that. People at the film museum also will help me with the identification. Uh, the, the veterinarian specialized in bird anatomy from uh, UI uh, UC, and the various people uh, specialized in visual imaging. Uh, and so we this is the so people who printed my family. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>